Yeah, if you would like to contribute to the notes on the session, uh, we're we're taking notes and you take them in Etherpad. So if you guys. All right, I think this session is a uh, time to start. So welcome to EMU. Uh, you've probably all seen the note well multiple times, but since it's Monday, you probably should you haven't seen it before. Take a quick look. So we have uh, started a GitHub uh, uh, section so that uh, we can work on our drafts there. And I think several of the drafts are already up there. Um, so let us know what you think of this. We've used this in TLS extensively, and I know a number of other groups have used it a lot to help track issues in the status of the document. So emu-wg is what you're looking for on GitHub. OK, for the agenda, I think uh, blue sheets, we should send those around. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about uh, EAP TLS and then uh, EAP AKA. And then a couple of the items that are uh, uh, newer items that aren't quite on the charter yet. So um, anything anybody else had, any agenda bashing that needs to be done? So we have uh, two working uh, group drafts right now. And I, they're different kind of drafts than, I guess, there's an emu beer in, in Australia so or... I think it's Australia. Um, and, uh, but our, the drafts we're working on are different. Uh, we have the EPTLS one, two, one, two, three, and the EMU, uh, the EPK this. So those are the current working group items. Uh, I think we'll have a couple more that we'll be bringing into the working group soon. And hopefully we can start getting these towards uh, completion as well. So I think uh, this will be a good meeting. I think there's uh, significant work done on both of these areas. So and I think now we go to, are we up with, uh, which is the, yeah, uh oh. Uh -oh. Is this where we want to start? Are you good, John? I think so. Okay. I think you, you may need to let us know when you want to uh, change slides. I don't know if you can do it remotely. i let you know. Do you have something? There. Yeah. Now I see. <clears throat> Great. So this is... Uh, version 2 of uh, the EPTLS 1.3 draft. Uh, the version that was presented at the last meeting was 00. zero. So we have seen two updates of these drafts. <clears throat> and basically the, the discussions and conclusions last time was to, most of the things we discussed at the last meeting, we decided not to change. Uh, but there were two things that we decided to change, and that has been done. So one of the changes are quite straightforward. The session ID now starts with 0D, as suggested by Banan Abuba. Uh, the other discussion resulted in a comment from and suggestion by Jim Shad to add an empty TLS record to the protocol uh, when uh, to uh, lower the uncertainty from the EAP peer. I'll go into the details of this. Uh, but this has been done, and there is a new section in the document called EAP state machines that discusses this. And then there are some editorial changes. And this was the changes to the between the 00 and 01 version. Then the changes between the 01 and the 02 version are only in the privacy considerations and considerations for pervasive monitoring, as well as some additional 
editorial changes. Yeah, so the first change is, as I said, quite straightforward. Uh, EPTLS should start with 0D uh, hex value, and this was missing from 00, zero as pointed out by Manard. Uh, so this is now updated. Um, instead of deriving the session ID directly from the TLS exporter, uh, a value called method ID um, is derived. And this is according to uh, some other EAP T RFC, I don't remember which. And then the session ID is created by concatenating 0D with the method ID. Uh, and this makes the session ID 65 bytes long as in RFC 52.16. Yeah. Next slide, unless there is any comments. Uh, <clears throat> other change that may require some more discussion is the empty TLS record. Uh, and this was brought, the discussion was brought up by Juni at the, when he implemented the zero, maybe not the zero, zero version, but the version even before. And he said that with a new session ticket, it's hard for the client to know what will come next. And it messes up the EAP state machine a little bit. Then there was a comment from Banan that it should be made cryptographically secure, and Jim Shad suggested adding an empty TLS record, which seems like a good idea. So the mechanism implemented in 01 and 02 is that uh, the uh, EAP server commits to not send any handshake messages. Uh, and handshake messages include the uh, post handshake messages, including then new sec session ticket. And it does that by sending a uh, empty TLS record. Um, don't know if you should go through the pictures first. Um, uh, let's see, uh, empty TLS record, this is just an empty application data. Application data record layer with lengths where the plain text length is zero. And after doing this, um, the server does not send any more handshake messages. Uh, it, but it's still three possible options what it might send, send after this. It's if success, failure, or a TLS alert message. Mm. And as I, I will show you pictures of all of this, uh, but yeah. So first, here's the uh, case when we have ex success. To the left, we have a, the ordinary successful mutual authentication. And as you can see here, marked with a green uh, rectangle, we have a new field here, a TLS empty record. And by sending this, the server commits to not sending any more handshake messages. And here in the case of a successful client authentication, the server responds with EAP success. On the right side, we see a mutual authentication, successful mutual authentication where the server sends a new session ticket to enable resumption in the future. And in this case, the server does not send the empty record after it's finished because it's, it will send a post handshake. So it sends an empty record after the new session ticket. And then in this case, everything is successful. Next picture. Uh, here is the message diagrams when you have a failure. Uh, in the left, page here, there is um, there is no empty record because we never reached that state. The client, uh, the server reacts the client hello. In the right side, uh, we have 
this case where the server authentication fails or the client reacts it for some reason. And then and this is the case without the new session ticket. Then the client, the server sends TLS empty record and afterwards there will be a EAP failure. And then next slide, we will have the most complicated case. So here is, on the left side here is the successful mutual authentication as described earlier. Uh, the server commits to not sending any more handshake messages and if everything is okay it will send e success. Uh, here but on the other hand if everything is not okay here so the server rejects the client authentication then the server responds with a EAP request uh, with a TLS alert message. Uh, so the commit here with the empty record is to not send handshake messages. And this is, I think, the best we can do. At least it, this is, as far as I can understand, aligning with RFC 5216, in which this case is what happened uh, if um, the client authentication fails during a resumption. Then you have the same. Uh, scenario. This service sends either success or it sends an TLS alert message. Um, yeah, no comments. Then, uh, uh, ah, sitting. Um, so the next slide is uh, potential updates to this. Um, one thing was that when writing this um, uh, presentation, I noticed that we have error cases for, we have figures illustrating the message flows for basically every error cases. And this was requested uh, on the mailing list to add more error cases and I saw now that we don't have an error cases for the EAP TLS client reacting the new session ticket. I assume the client would send a TLS alert message in that case. Uh, do we want such a figure then that could be added to the next version? Um, then Further update a couple of, we have had discussion about privacy. Um, the e peer may reveal its identity in two different ways. It's firstly, it can send its identity in clear text in the first EAP response called my, ident uh, my ID, I think, or my identity in the draft. And this is for all TLS version. And the second way the e peer may reveal its identity is to send its certificate in clear text. And this only happens in uh, previous versions of um, TLS. Um, and what we can do in the privacy, for privacy is a little bit restricted with what kind of legacy interop uh, a deployment wants. Uh, but one thought I had was that can we do something more specific about the identity sent in the first message? Can we can we always can we recommend or mandate that the peer sends a confidential identity, for example, anonymous NI, or is there EAP service that will not like this. Uh, RFC 5216 is, uh, doesn't say very much about this. It says that service may, that does not support privacy, may, may uh, go to failure when the client sends an empty certificate list, but it doesn't say anything about identities as far as I see. Yeah, 
question from Jim. Um, Jim Shaw. Um, it, in point of fact, Ashley Radix um, essentially says you do send just at your domain and in the first in the first EAP message, um, and they use EAP TLS in a lot of places. So that is standard behavior. That's there's no problems with that. Yeah. So should we have? Can we have must? Do yes. That? Yeah. Good. Uh, that's good. Um, let's see the third future potential update that I have been considering when writing now the updated privacy section is that should the draft give any guidance since RC five two one six was published, um, several attacks on TLS, earlier versions of TLS have been published, which is one of the reasons why TLS 103 was uh, developed and published. Uh, but uh, in fact, m most of these attacks do not really apply to EAP TLS, as EAP TLS only do a handshake and does not protect application data for a long period of time. Uh, but some of the attacks probably do, even if I have not remembering the details. Should the draft give uh, guidance or references how an implementation should mitigate attacks on earlier version of TLS? Um, so speaking as an individual, I. Right now, and this is Joe Salloway, um, I would, I, I think certainly we shouldn't really talk about things that aren't actionable to somebody who's implementing it for things that don't apply. I don't, I don't think we should, should uh, include. Um, I'm also a little bit reluctant to include things re relevant to earlier versions in this particular update. Um, yeah. But um, I'd like to hear other people. So, Yari. Yari Akko. And I agree with, um, with your advice. Uh, what I came up to say here, though, that is that uh, I struggled a little bit with the similar issue in the uh, AKA um, draft, like how much of the AKA attacks should I describe? And one of the crucial things I, I, I think determines this is if there is a reasonable reference for for those other things and I, I so i assume in the case of tls there there is that tls working group documents perhaps the ls 113 document actually describes some of those old attacks so you have a good reference to point to and then you could just handle the things that actually apply to your protocol so i just have a question this is elliot lear the question is um, if, if there are attacks against TLS 1.3 in particular that would not be mitigated by the advice given in security considerations for 1.3 and are would, or are in any way specific to EAP, for instance, then I think those have to be described here in some detail. I don't know if So it, it doesn't seem that we should have a long section on this. I don't think there are any attacks on TLS 1.3. Uh, I think there is a document in using TLS in application describing attacks. Um, should we just refer to that or not even referring to that? If, if This is Elliot again. If you think the attacks are applicable, then you certainly should refer to them. You, you don't have to re-describe it, but adding maybe, a, a, at least my advice, would be to just add a reference, but not to spend a lot of effort recapitulating every, something that went through a whole, the whole process of an RFC to you know, produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also not, not clear to me that we'd 
we want to go too much into what the problems are with the old versions and how you may or may not be able to protect against them. Um, I'm a bit, I'm a little bit torn because they, that could be useful information for some implementations, but really if they're reading this document, I think they're more looking to implement the new thing. But if at the same time they could mitigate old things, that, that would be good. So, oh, I had a short reference then to that draft. So just this is Elliot again. One thing you can do is you can put actually something in the front matter of this document, which says this is actually, the attacks are actually motivation for this work, right? In, at least in part, some of some of the the holes in the earlier versions of TLS are motivations, and and I think you've done some of that, right? But just maybe you could even add a reference up front uh, against that. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to go into any detail. I, I really wouldn't. Right. That anytime we muck up these specifications with a lot of, you know, motivational material, if it gets too motivational, people are like, okay, get on with it. What's the spec? Right. But a line is not too much. Yeah. Good. So, so may, may, maybe the appropriate thing to do would be to figure out what, what is applicable or you know what attacks are applicable and and if there's anything that we should that we could put in the document and see if that's something that would make sense um it's not clear to me that there's going to be a whole lot um okay. so sorry yeah. <laughs> Hi, this is elliot again so the, one of the reasons I, I i'm sorry for um speaking so many times with the microphone one of one of the nice things about doing a little bit of that is that some of the attacks that we've seen on earlier versions of tls are are like browser specific or you know very very much focused on on that on, on that particular use of TLS and um, so calling out the non browser risks you know a, a line or two in the non browser risks maybe might might be useful and the reason that I say that is that what we've seen and maybe this is a good thing but we've seen basically a blanket you know attempt to just get to the, to the latest version of TLS without actual analysis of what the attacks are and that 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 poses a long-term threat in terms of people having spent money on upgrades that they didn't need and they say oh you're just the boy who cried wolf again see having actually specific justification does help on that point i could uh, i could send an email to the use of tls in application list and the tls working group and see if asking for advice what that what of the attacks would specifically apply to um, eap tls when you only use the handshake um, these group working groups have the experts in these areas and there are people that probably have these details in their heads <laughs> let's see if we get any advice yeah. I mean, that's, that's probably a good approach. I, I think that there may still be um, uh, the, the people in those groups won't know exactly how EAP uses it and, and those particular use cases. So they may not, they may or may not, you may or may not get good feedback from that. That's yeah. I add, an, I add a reference and then, uh, and then we'll see what feedback I get from the discussion. And, but we keep it short and very uh, only things applic really applicable to EAP TLS. Yeah. Not spending too much time on that. Yeah, um, I think mm, let's turn in more questions. Next slide. So uh, this was quite short. Uh, I take that as people like the changes if they have read them. I think this, what this draft needs now is more, more reviews and more feedback, also more implementations and possibly interop. Um, I don't know, uh, what's the shares views? How do we move forward? Um, could we get somebody to commit to review this or? How many folks in the room have read the draft? 
Okay. Yeah, we would, in order to kind of move forward on some of these, uh, we need some more reviewers. Is there people, folks in here who could commit to doing a review? Jim Shod, anybody else? What's your name, please? Chuck. Make sure make sure we get that in the notes. Daniel, you want to review as well? Yeah, so I think we can get some more reviews. Do we have, how many implementations do we know of? Any? Juni had implemented this at least okay. in earlier version. So we'll need to find some more implementers to have an interop. <laughs> so I think if we can get a, a few more reviews and, and kind of finalize uh, these last open issues, which just seem pretty, pretty minor, uh, we may be able to start working towards a working group last call on this. Seems good. Yeah, I think that's all right. Good. All right, and the next is large certificates. Yeah. Great. So this presentation will hopefully be very short. Uh, so we made an update based on the discussion at the last ITF. Can go to the next slide. Uh, so it has been updated from 00, 00 to 0 01. And there's not that much add, added information. It's the draft has been reorganized to distinguish between recommendation requiring change of certificates and recommendation only requiring changing the code. I, for example, updating to TLS 1.3. Uh, so there, and there's some new text um, describing the cached information extension that was discussed at the last time, stating that it uh, in some cases is not helpful if the handshake fails anyway, but it can be helpful if you have done an authentication in your home network and then you're roaming and a full handshake without this would fail. This can make it uh, possible to do a handshake there, authentication. Uh, then there is a new text uh, stating that TLS can significantly reduce the number of messages exchanged. Uh, there's a new section placeholder for guidelines for certificates, more going into the details of uh, different fields and things you should do in the certificates. And then there are some um, editorial changes. Can go to the next slide. Um, so the new document structure is basically to split up section four into three different subsections where 4.1 looks at things updating certificates, 4.2 looks at recommendation and guidelines updating code, and 4.3 have guidelines for certificates. And here we are waiting for input. Um, Sean Turner promised to write something eventually here, which we might hopefully have to the next item meeting. Like what, what was, what sort of things were gonna go in the guidelines section? Uh, so, Mohit, uh, no hat. Uh, so, Sean Turner had some ideas on how you can uh, give guidelines to people issuing certificates, like don't put know tons of uh, OIDs into the certificate don't have like thousands of subject alt names in the certificate so those kind of guidelines especially so using TLS on the web 
is a little bit different from using TLS on, on EAP where you have access points that drop sessions if, if they don't complete in, in time. OK. We can try to find Sean and poke him. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Next slide. So that's it. Um, except that planned update from Sean. Uh, I don't think we have many, very many else uh, planned updates. We will need suggestions and reviews and feedback from the working group. Um, and both this and the e EAP TLS 1.3 draft is on GitHub. So if you want to know what we are planning for the next version and any open issues, you should look there and feel free to commit issues there or make a pull request or comment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any additional uh, questions or comments on this? We'll we'll need reviewers for for this as well. Uh, but I think we focus on the TLS one three, getting those reviews done, and if we get that moving, we'll be able to get this moving too. I think. All right. Anything else with respect to EPTLS? All right, thank you, John. And I think uh, we'll move to Heap, AKA. Yari, you're up. Let's see. Here's a, let me just get this centered for you. Okay, so I'm just gonna go, go through um, the draft and some of the, the issues there and um, and if uh, you're in the room and, and, and don't know what this is about, this is basically uh, some old <laughs> or 10 plus years old technology that uh, um, has been very widely implemented, but is now finding also use in, in the upcoming 5G standards. And as part of that, we're trying to make sure that uh, everything's uh, correct and uh, things that we've learned in the past or things that we missed uh, on the first specifications are actually corrected. And uh, the initial thought was that uh, there's three things that we need to do. Um, identifiers are a little special in 5G, so I figured we need to do something for that. Uh, the uh, EAP AKA Prime, that's sort of like a network name binding that, that you, um, uh, or both parties agree to what, what, they're, uh, what they're authenticating for, what network they're connecting to. Um, and that changes a little bit also for 5G, so fix that. Um, and then we knew that uh, exported parameters were forgotten in the old RFCs, that we didn't do that even though some other RFC required that. So fix those three things. Um, but it turned out that, that we actually needed to do a bunch of other stuff too. Um, in the meantime, the, so the IETF uh, demands for what should you talk about in the security consideration section have increased, like talk about privacy more, talk about pervasive monitoring considerations. Um, of course, we learned something about vulnerabilities in the meantime, so do do document those better. Um, also, we got some comments uh, actually from John relating to uh, uh, pseudonyms and fast reauthentication identifiers and how their spec on the previous version was <clears throat> a little bit uh, weak. It didn't specify how to do that securely or didn't set the requirements right. So we did that and updated some references. There's been two updates since last ITF 02 and 03. Um, the general status is that we now believe that this, uh, well, I know I said this before, but now we really believe that this is in sync with 3GPP specs. Uh, we've done some 5G related updates, we've done some general updates, and we've done a lot of work with the security consideration section. I'm gonna go through some of the main points here. Um, so first of all, identifiers, um, this was kind of clear previously, um, use the name that was sent uh, in, in, in this protocol. Um, and, and it's important to get this right because the identifiers are not just like things to point to the right record, but it's actually also used as bits inside the, the um, <clears throat> key derivation. So 
So if you get it wrong, it, it's going to fail miserably. <clears throat> but in 5G, <clears throat> there's a couple of ad additional considerations. The um, <clears throat> First of all, the EAP session is inside the 5G native uh, attachment procedure, and you don't actually need the EAP identity request and response. It's sort of an extra round trip for no, no good reason. Um, have to take that out into account. There's also two different identifiers. One is the uh, permanent identifier called the SUPI, uh, and, um, and then there's a concealed or privacy-friendly uh, identifier called the SUKI or SUSI. And, and the idea is that these are used for different purposes. The, the permanent one we can use for key generation, or that's that's what they wanted at 3GPP. So that's what we'll do. Um, and then obviously the privacy-friendly one is the one that we should use for any any other um, passing of identifiers around. And uh, there's a couple of things in the draft. Uh, first of all, uh, you um, or there's additional text to fix this case where, like the previous RFC said, that always ask or should ask, I think, was the, was the um, phrasing for identifiers inside the EAP AK method rather than in the EAP framework. But uh, in, in a case where you are connecting to a 5G network and using the 5G protocols to do the signaling and, and then carrying EAP there, then you do something slightly different, which of course is also requirement that implementations to be able to do this or detect this kind of situation. <clears throat> um, but of course, we can't really always guarantee that there's there's never a case where no no identifiers are uh, asked for. So one has to build for that situation that uh, you as uh, phone or, or some kind of other client will actually get a request for identity. What do you do then? Well, um, 3GPP had developed a table what to do in these different cases there. And we basically follow that same here just to make sure that specs are aligned. This applies only to 5G case here. Um, and I don't represent the whole table here. That would be pointless. Let's give you an example. <coughs> so in 5G, because the basically all the identifiers that you pass around publicly are privacy friendly identifiers. Now, if the, on the EAP level, somebody asks you for the permanent identifier, then that's, that's a warning sign. You should probably not, not agree to that. So that's why the spec said, says should respond with an error code in that case. Um, key generation, I mentioned that, that we use one, one of these two special identifiers in key, key derivation. So there's some language about that, like under what condition you do that, and then this is what you do, and these are the bits. Um, and regarding the bits, um, there's a format question. It's not just a conceptual thing, but also uh, a question of uh, exactly how to represent things. There's a reference here to uh, 3GPP specifications where they represent their identifiers in, in an NAI format. Um, so their identifiers can be regular NAIs, but they can also be IMC numbers. Um, and, and there's uh, two di different uh, identifiers, as, as mentioned earlier. So one, one is this uh, permanent one that is in the clear. Um, here's the example on the upper, um, or the upper example is like that. It's kind of uh, easily readable. And then there's a, <laughs> Encrypted identifier where the network part is um, like you, you specify what operator you're going to, but then you hide the subscriber identity part with uh, public key encryption that's been specified in, in 3GPP, but it still maps to a, in AI. And so we don't specify any of that. We just point to that and, and provide some examples. So that's identifiers. Um, and then we have another thing that we want to make sure that the 3GPP um, specifications for 5G and, and the RFCs agree, because the previous RFC declared that in, in, in these and these, these situations, you use like these strings to determine, like this is um, for wireless LANs, this is the string that you should use, and, and, and so on. Now here in with 5G, we're introducing a new string. The, the actual strings are in the 3GPP spec, but but it's a different document and different version than, than the one pointed to by the original RFC. So, so we pointed to both. 
and um, and then their clients are required to, or actually in this case, the server is required to to uh, figure out what what is being done and which which identity or which network name to use. Uh, we export some parameters uh, for session IDs, um, for fast reauth and for the regular case, um, and some peer IDs and, and server IDs. I should note that, that we're actually in, in sort of the common case here, uh, peer ID and server ID actually turns out to be the empty string mm, because they're like, well, um, Un unless the P uh, the IDs have been passed in inside the um, the EAP protocol, which in this case doesn't, or at least for five G doesn't usually happen, then uh, then you don't have that unless you take the ID that was passed in in the lower layer. And we chose to use the empty string. Not quite sure if this is a problem or not. I, I think it's not a problem. Um, if people have comments on that, that would be useful. My understanding also is that the, while while there is an RFC that requires us to export these parameters from EAP methods, there isn't a lot of implementations or even any implementations that would actually use this information. I don't know if people who have EAP experience care to comment if they've seen this this information. But depending on the answers, this either matters a lot or or, or doesn't matter a lot. Moving on, um, I would just I, you might check if it's relevant to you. I think the ABFAB use did you look into like there was this ABFAB effort that used EAP within GSS API <laughs> or or something of that nature, um, and they might have used those okay. quantities. I'm not sure, and I'm not sure if that's even relevant to your use case. So we, we looked at some common open source implementations and didn't okay. find any code for this, but. Um, right. Fair <laughs> enough. Other than that, the only uses of that type of information I know is for like accounting purposes, which you probably have dealt with in another way. Um, and then uh, the previous RFCs, and this has nothing to do with uh, 5G. This is like a totally um, um, general uh, change. The previous uh, RFCs defined this uh, pseudonym approach and fast reauthentication uh, identity approach. Um, and they, they sort of provided um, special usernames that can be used in these, these processes. And uh, and the assumption was that this be like totally random, and uh, you know you cannot figure out what the user is from those. But we didn't actually say that in the specs. So so now we're trying to say that that you have to generate them in a fashion that doesn't reveal information about the subscriber or the user. And um, so for instance, uh, a counter would be a bad idea. A random number would be a relatively good idea. Uh, username dash counter would be a terrible idea, and so on. Uh, we wrote an entirely new section on privacy considerations, um, just going through the basic implications of different identifier types. Uh, we set some limits on what to do in 5G. Um, so if in 5G you are sort of protected against privacy uh, violations, so uh, looking at the identifiers, and then then you suddenly use pseudonyms and use the same pseudonym multiple times, then then you've disclosed that, that you're the same entity in these two, two instances, and that's bad. So, so the purpose of the 5G enhancements would be lost if, if you did that. So we, we are prohibiting that. We discussed the implications of different uh, protection profiles. So 3GPP, when they did this encryption of identifiers, they have multiple different profiles, including the null profile. It's surprisingly doesn't provide much privacy. We discussed that. And we discussed that the uh, Domain or operator is typically visible in these identifiers, even if the subscriber identifier is, is visible uh, is hidden. We also added a section on pervasive surveillance considerations, discusses in particular the attacks that were claimed to have happened um, a couple of years ago, 2015. Um, the SIM heist. Look up the reference from the draft. Um, and obviously, all protocols are vulnerable to compromise of the primary key material. We discuss some specific means to make sure that that doesn't happen when you manufacture these cards. 
Uh, and we also suggest that some form of perfect forward secrecy protection may be useful. We're not requiring that or pointing to, like, you know, must do this spec, um, even if we have a spec that we'll, I'll talk about in, in, in a moment. But uh, so we're just uh, providing some advice here. We did add a fairly extensive section on discovered vulnerabilities, and this is what I was referring to when we were talking about Jones draft uh, and how much to talk about general AKA issues, how much to talk about AKA prime issues. Um, and I didn't have a really good, ref or we were unable to find a really good reference for, you know, here are all the attacks, you know, sort of uh, fair and balanced manner reported uh, on, on AKA. So we tried to write our own. Um, we do try to point out which things actually apply to to AKA um, or EAP AKA and, and which do not. Um, so basically there's no like, like there's no attacks on the on the fundamental properties of, of authentication under under the original assumptions, but but you have tons tons of um, different attacks. Um, so obviously if you leak the primary key material, you're you're uh, gonna have some breakage. So that, that was what we talked about previously in the sim heist case. You can ha also have the protocol participants misbehave. So in, in AAA systems, network access, you typically give some keys to the local network giving you access uh, and then like your access point or your 5G network or whatever could potentially claim to be the, the uh, uh, user in, 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 sen in the sense of sending packets apparently from the user. Um, and and that, that's how it is. I mean, that it's not that necessarily super concerning, but that, that's, that's how things, things are in, in almost all access networks that I can, can think of or in all authentication schemes that I can think of. Um, and, uh, and then there's some other stuff that is not really relevant for this, but I did point to like this, uh, we did um, some of us uh, RFC 3310, that is AKA inside HTTP. And uh, it turned out to go really badly. And um, we didn't use the key, uh, crypto keys in the end result, which meant that this is vulnerable to the man in the middle attacks. And fix that in a later RFC 4169, so we're clear, except that that's now what ten years ago, and um, and some people are still using the older one, including some SDOs referring to the older, older spec, for some reason. Um, maybe that's a task for some some of us to go and fix, but um, that's how it is. So that's that's basically the the bigger issues in, in, in this draft or issues or, or things that we had done in the in the previous round and uh, and where we are, um, would love to get feedback and discussion. Um, there's some ongoing discussion also with some 3GPP people. I've been able to at least interact with some, some other implementers. Um, we're implementing some of this. Um, but there's also others that, that do this and like going back and forth, like, okay, what do you put in the identifier fields has been useful. Uh, we're all also trying to add a reference to this draft um, to 3GPP specs. Um, we'll see if that happens, hopefully. Um, They're having a meeting uh, next week, I think. And um, we think we understand now the in interactions between the uh, 3GPP specs and and this, and uh, maybe this. It, it's worthwhile to note that, like, why why do we have to do anything to begin with? Like, you know, if they just use your your RFC, like, what's the problem? And and that would not have been a problem if they just used the RFC, but they actually wanted to use the RFC, but do these and these changes and behave in this slightly different manner. So that's why we have to try and um, sync up because the, the, if we don't sync up, then then the result is that the RFC will say something and possibly some implementations will follow the RFC and not, not do the 5G thing, for instance. We talked about working group last call. I think if we did one now, like after the, the meeting, um, that would align nicely with some other things. So 
So are you, and, and right now the draft is up to date as with all the kind of discussions and things that you've had in 3GPP and elsewhere. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Is is any how many people have read uh, this 5448 bis? Or any any version or later the better, but okay. Uh, would some of you be able to, if we do a working group last call, can you give a review of the latest changes? Okay. Thank awesome. you, Russ. So yeah, I, I think we can bring this to a working group last call. Okay. Okay. Are we on the next uh, that button? And, you know, this one. Yeah. Yep. Should be good to go. Okay. So, so this is the other draft. This is an extension to the previous work, or the, or any um, EAP, aka Prime protocol, could be extended in this this fashion. It's uh, not a working group document that but, but we do have a work item in the working group charter for this and um, we've discussed about this um, extensively last time also uh, I have taken into account uh, reviews or the discussion that we had last time and uh, uh, for instance Mohit's uh, review um, and 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 this version is is um, more detailed we also renamed the attributes and made the protocol uh, use the ECDHE uh, uh, terminology and RFC 8031 terminology. Uh, and we clarified the use of the negotiation process. Uh, we only send one key if there's like negotiate groups or algorithms and, and so on. So we never send like multiple keys. We always send exactly one key, the, the one that we're trying to do. And um, we clarified the resulting security properties, uh, which was an interesting exercise, um, trying to understand exactly what does this mean. And then uh, last time, uh, what have been Hannes who brought up denial service attacks, tried to clarify that as well. And so basically the protocol is that uh, there's a pair and the server and and they pick some, some private information and, and generate some uh, public keys based on that using uh, elliptic curves uh, send an EAP aka challenge request with like the, all the usual attributes but also um, the um, uh, attributes relating to uh, to the perfect forward secrecy calculation and now my attribute names may not be actually updated on this slide uh, entirely but um, it should be updated in the draft um, and then uh, if if the peer pair uh, does not support this or doesn't know anything about this this protocol, then it will just ignore this and continue as 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 it does normally if if that's allowed by the uh, the parties. But if it does understand and want to do this protocol, then it also picks its private information, uh, generates a, a public key um, and does some calculations and sends the public key to the other side. It also does some calculations uh, based on the private information and, and the other side's public uh, information. You calculate the shared secret and then you feed that shared secret into the process that normally in EAP, EAP aka prime would result in the master keys. And, and then you use that. Or would result in the, in the keys that are output from from EAP, uh, AKA process or the EAP method. So it's pretty simple at that level. Um, there are some tricky parts though. So one is backwards compatibility that I already talked about a little bit, how to avoid changes um, or how to run in, in different kinds of environments where not everybody may be supporting this yet um, and how to minimize changes all over. Uh, there's some negotiation issues with both, like how do you negotiate if you have support multiple algorithms or groups, uh, and and since there's already negotiation processes in in the EAP AKA Prime, how do you fit together with that? 
and then there's DOS issues. So I'm going to go through these briefly. Um, so the first design principle was that like we don't want actually want to affect the SIM cards because that would mean like we'd have to send SIM cards to everybody again, a um, couple of billion uh, SIM cards that would cost a, uh, at least a couple of billion in the stamps alone. Um, so, so we tried to do this on the phone and then on the uh, network side, we tried to put it on the EAP server code, not, not, the, not the server that uh, holds the, the permanent secrets. Um, so this keeps the interface, the SIM card and the, the, the authentication uh, database unchanged. And, um, and no changes to the, no, minimal, minimal changes to infrastructure and no changes to credentials. But of course, you have to change the phone. Well, you have to update the phones. You have to update the EAP server. Um, the the other one is that uh, we wanted to make sure that we can do this in a backwards compatible fashion, even if like we have partial deployment and like my server supports this already, but not every phone does it yet, and we can't exactly figure out what what phone is on the other end at that point. Um, so we want to avoid um, situation where would like have to wait until everybody is deployed, or cause some penalty in performance when when uh, expectations don't match. So we wanted to do this so that there's no extra round trips when we use this new feature, and if we fail to use the new feature, I have to go back to the old way of doing things. There's also no extra round trips in that case. In terms of we can run the pod process in parallel, we just do the old thing. And then on, on top of that, that, we do the new thing in the same messages. And um, and if, if that succeeds and both parties support it, then, then the output kits will, will, will take into account the new thing. So, so in, in your use cases with 3GPP, would it be possible to, instead of could you use a different EAP number? Um, different method type. Yeah, different method type. One could, yes. Because I am i haven't looked at it enough, but you could try a, an approach where you had were able to encrypt more of your messages using the Diffie-Hellman. Uh, it might always add an extra round trip. Yeah, that, that is the cost. OK. Yeah. And I'm not, like, we'd have to do the math. Like, what? What's the benefit? But that, that is exactly the cost. That would add an EAP level uh, negotiation if the other guy doesn't support this new type. Right. And 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 that's that that's because the, the way that the EAP was originally yeah, yeah, defined. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's, it's and, and you don't have because yeah. All right. That, I mean, that might be something to have a little bit of a discussion about. And see, see if he, I, I don't know what benefit you would necessarily get from it, from encryption either, but um, I mean, you, you would get the benefit of the encryption, but how important that is in this scheme? Yeah, but you, you don't scheme. get like the the encryption that you would get. Like, it's actually, I, I think it's not not the like the, there's other ways of doing this, but um, I think the be beneficial ways, potent like. If you just do like an EAP level negotiation, I don't think you actually get any benefit from that. You just do the same thing, but then, but if you reorganize the, the messages in some other fashion that you did, like um, a little bit like IKV2 uh, or IKV1 uh, does, that you first do this key material generation thing, and then on the next set of messages you do the rest, and then you can actually encrypt maybe more, um, and that that might be a like a useful thing to do. But even that has the trade off of next around it yeah um, so this uh, negotiation or new negotiation in this um, extension so it's a simple extension but but you still have to build for the possibility that there'll be more than one algorithm or more than one more than one group in the future um, so, so for that, that we have this uh, AT uh, KDF PFS um, that indicates uh, the the preferred algorithm is just the first one, and then the possible other algorithms. The server sends this, 
Um, and if the preferred algorithm is acceptable, then the peer just executes this pr uh, protocol and, and proceeds and there's no RTT hit. But if, if you do want to do some of the other ones, not the preferred algorithm by the server, then, um, uh, then, then the peer indicates that I want this, this other thing instead and then the server responds and then there's some special rules that you like uh, you you carry the the all the relevant information still in all the all the messages that you can't actually change anything without causing the the max to fail um, and you have to check for that but that that's always a round trip um, that is added if, if, if you don't go for the default and only the key for the like you sent the generated public key uh, on the on the first message from the server uh, assuming that the guy uh, will will accept the preferred algorithm, and if if it doesn't, then you have to send another one with with the other key. But you never send more than one, exactly one, always. And then there's a question of how does this negotiation process fit with the previous negotiation that exists for the uh, uh, KDF um, uh, negotiation in the original RFC. And um, they're actually very similar. They're exact, exactly the same process, just that they're uh, negotiating a different thing. And um, they're currently defined as separate. Like if, if you have to do the negotiation, then you do one and then you do the other one after that. Um, in theory, we could probably define this to happen also in parallel, but maybe that's not worth our time. Seems simpler this way. Um, if people have opinions otherwise, then, then we can talk about that. Denial of service. And, and uh, Hannes had this question last time, and Russ, I think you were also commenting on that, that uh, about the order of computations. And that was actually partially in the draft already uh, last ICF, uh, but it wasn't entirely there. And now we uh, have all of that there and, and also talk about it in the security considerations. And here's the deal. Um, so the first message in this whole protocol comes from the server. And, and it doesn't come unless you like you're already identified that this is this is the given subscriber or that like we haven't authenticated the subscriber but but we've seen a valid username. And you can spoof this um, but it requires that attackers at least use specific real identities. They can't just randomly generate numbers and, and try and use them. Um, so that's first level of defense. And the second level of defense is that once you get the, the messages, then all the parties, at both on the peer and the server side, they will first do the, the old process. They will authenticate using the long-term shared secrets um, and make sure that, that that succeeds and if it doesn't succeed, then the person um, or the other party doesn't have the right key, and therefore this is an attack, and you 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 bail out. You never do the expensive computation. It's only after that succeeds that that you you run the expensive computations. Um, so the parties need to show possession of the of the key material before they they do the heavy calculations. Plus, um, sorry, I just don't remember where the Mac check falls and where the key for the Mac comes from, but it seems that it's important to avoid the downgrade of algorithm attack, the Mac, right? Yes. So it would also, I think, affect this. Uh, so, so the Mac, I, I, I think the Mac is, is done like it's it's done as the 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 the, the previous um, uh, or the original RFC does that. So so you calculate that uh, the MAC process is is done. That that is step one, and step two is generate the keys, and then the resulting higher quality key, key is then that is the output from the EAP process. So now your Right. Traffic protection can be protected with these higher quality keys, but your Mac was still run on the original process. So what I think you said, and I'm just repeating it back to make sure I understood, okay. is that the Mac is dependent on the base AKA authentication. Yes. Okay, thanks. 
And um, so after all of this, like if, if you still have somebody who's trying to dose you um, successfully, then you can take some operations actions like you know, blocking that particular subscriber. It seems to be sending millions of requests, for instance. I updated the security properties also. Um, I'm trying to be accurate here. So basically, what does this give you? Uh, it gives you that, um, like, if if we have used the SIM card and now somebody at some point learns the key, then and 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 that that somebody has recorded all your previous conversations. Um, um, now you can't go back and look at those previous conversations and decrypt them because DFS was was in effect in in, in those things. And also, if the attacker still, ha I mean, has the key but doesn't do active attacks, then future communications are also secure. And then if if the attacker who has the long-term key is also an active attack, then nothing can be done. Like they can they can do anything. They can be pretend to be any of the parties. They can they can be also be a mitum if they need to. Um, and they can determine the session keys, change the negotiations. They know the secret. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that that's the that's the end of my list of these uh, tricky things here that or the updates that that we've we've done. And uh, like with the previous one, love to get some feedback um, or even more feedback than we've gotten so far. And uh, I think this, at least from our side, would be interesting to see this um, as, as a working group um, document. Again, there's this window of thing um, for some some amount of time in the future. It's not, not the next week thing, but <laughs> for the next half a year or something like that, if, if we have a solution in this space, we might actually be able to stick this in into the next release and actually have an effect on on people's security in this sense, um, protection from the um, organizations that try and spy on things, and uh, and there's some some interest uh, from our side certainly, and then another manufacturer uh, working on the chipsets may be also interested on this. Um, so we might actually get this actually deployed if we do do it. So I would love to move forward on this. So that's okay. the end of my, my part. How many folks have uh, read at least one version of the AKPFS? Not so many, but a couple. That's good. Um, and is anybody... Well, let's let's take a kind of an informal humble, and then we'll take it to the list. But does uh, I'll ask how many people support adoption, and if anybody's against adoption of this. So, uh, hum if you support adoption. Okay, hum if you object to the adoption of this. Uh, object to the adoption of this document. The abduction of this document. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll take it to the list. But thanks, Yara. Thank you. All right. Next up, Deep Noob. Uh, okay, so I wanted to tell about this um, EAP method uh, called EAP Noob, a nimble out of band authentication for EAP. And uh, what it um, does is it's a bootstrapping method for smart appliances. Now, there are many of those, uh, but this is an EAP method. And uh, we have worked on this uh, for quite a while, a couple of years, and uh, uh, we are at the version four of the draft. Uh, the specification starts to be pretty complete, but there's still some things to do and, and to review and, and to document about the design process. Uh, 
so what problem does EAP noob solve? Uh, well, it is an EAP method uh, that is intended for deploying IoT devices or appliances out of the box when they have no identifiers, no credentials, uh, and uh, when you don't have professional system administrators doing the deployment, but just average users. And um, uh, what uh, method of authentication that do we use? Well, user-assisted out-of-band authentication. And uh, for example, uh, in the, our implementations, this has been scanning a dynamic QR code or dynamic uh, NFC tag. And um, in addition to, uh, to just authenticating the device once, uh, this method also registers new devices to the authentication server. So you don't want to let the user every time you want to connect to the, let's say, Wi-Fi network to, to redo this process, but, but once, and th then we create a permanent association for that device. And that association then authorizes the device in the future uh, for network connectivity, and it gives that device uh, an owner and, and assigns a network to it. So it, it's a two-way uh, authentication process and, and trust relation that is created. That is different from the current EAP methods, which require pre-registration of the peer devices. So here is the protocol architecture, and uh, we have, uh, as usual, in this case, a Wi-Fi network and uh, with an access point. And then we have this IoT appliance that would like to join the network. And uh, we have uh, some AAA server, like radio server, locally on the network. In, uh, in our use cases, we have kind of thought that uh, the actual server that does the authentication is a remote AAA server, maybe in the cloud, maybe on site, but it's, it's a separate you know, uh, AAA server that implements the uh, this EAP noob uh, out of band message processing and the user interface for that. And um, okay, so so what what's the point of this? Um, well, uh, we use the EAP tunnel for in band communication with the authentication server. So that way, we are actually actually the appliance is able to talk with the authentication server before it is registered on the network or registered at the authentication server and um, before it has ne full net internet connectivity. So that's the main trick that we are playing here. And uh, how do we achieve this? Well, uh, the device uh, initially uses this uh, network access identifier uh, noob at eabnoob.net um, because it doesn't yet know what identifier it will have, and uh, then we route the, those, those that realm uh, to this uh, special AAA server that supports our protocol, and um, then the out-of-band communication happens there. That's why we need this kind of special server because it needs to have a UI or API. Uh, for delivery of these out-of-band messages. So here in the picture, there's a single out-of-band message uh, from, the, uh, from this uh, appliance uh, through the user to this um, uh, UI, if it's, uh, um, if it's manual configuration or API, if the user is using, let's say, a smartphone with app to assist them. And uh, so there's just single message in one single direction that has been our design goal. And uh, that message could be could be in also in the server to peer direction. So we wanted to make the protocol as generic as possible and, and to allow both directions for this out of band message. Actually, the server to peer direction is easier to easier to uh, to get security. And uh, uh, here is then uh, a quick um, outline of the security protocol. I think it's pretty obvious to now that that if we see that the, so first in the band in the EAP channel uh, there is an this ECDH key exchange and uh, that is unauthenticated at this point and then we have the out of band communication uh, which authenticates the key exchange now we have two ways of authenticating that the first one uh, is a hash including this out of band message which is just a hash of this ECDH parameters and and 
prevents man in the middle attacks or impersonation attacks on that uh, the, the receiver of that message can verify that part of the uh, of the message and um, then um, after that this key confirmation and for that we have another part in this out of band message which is a secret nonce and uh, so these are the hoob and noob uh, and um, uh, those, that secret nonce will be used in the key confirmation step uh, for computing max and, and uh, that gives a second method of authentication so these are kind of redundant methods of authentication but but i'll explain soon why we have both and uh, here is just the names of the messages in the spec so there is the initial exchange there is the out of band step and then the completion exchange well this this is the protocol that takes place when you register the device and then in the future there will be the persistent association that is created um, here in the key after the key confirmation and uh, then reconnect to the network a rekeying happens with this reconnect exchange uh, which may use non cs or uh, for forward secrecy uh, also ECDH keys and um, that means the uh, user assisted step will not be repeated as long as the this uh, device stays re stays uh, registered and, and it will stay until the user resets uh, the association either at the server or, or the device end or actually has to do it at both ends okay so where does the what kind of security do we get here where does the security come from um well we had this one uh, we wanted to have uh, like minimal assumptions in the protocol on the out of band message uh, so it's just one message in either direction from server to peer or peer to server and um, we assume that the out of band channel will provide either integrity or secrecy but we don't require both but uh, of course we it's i would say it's like better to have both but if you think of um, uh, let's say you're scanning a QR code, someone could be spying on that QR code, so it might not be so securely secret. And uh, then uh, it's the only the integrity that remains to protect the security. So it's, it's kind of for failure, fail safety, we want to have these uh, two assumptions, secrecy and integrity of the out-of-band channel. There's some tricky case where, where the, so, so um, when there is no secrecy for that message, uh, you know, just one message is, is almost enough, but not quite enough. So the user needs to, in some cases, detect uh, the failure of one end to associate and then go and reset the other end. In, and um, and uh, uh, so, so that's a little bit more than just one message. Well, another concern that we have had in the last year, we've spent a lot of time on modeling this protocol and uh, and verifying its properties and then the main concern we, we had was this uh, denial of service attacks by someone a man in the middle attacker on the net on the in-band channel uh, like on the wireless network uh, who could cause maybe they could cause persistent failure of the protocol and uh, and i hope it's not oh, i feel so powerless Okay, so, so, so the man in the middle attacker, especially it could tamper messages or it could drop messages or maybe it could spoof error messages and, and, and use that for causing denial of service. And, and we, we can't avoid that, but, but we want to avoid persistent denial of service if the attacker then goes away. So here is a use case to get an idea. What is this useful for? Uh, so secure bootstrapping of cloud banished displays and this was our initial use case that motivated the work so here is a comic strip um, uh, there there is uh, Alice uh, who is attaching displays to the wall powers up one of those new displays uh, the display doesn't know where it is it scans the wireless networks looks for support for EAP noob when it finds that kind of network it con connects to that network uh, there happens to be just one in this case and and uh, uh, the initial exchange for the protocol happens in the background. Uh, it gets uh, a QR code. So this is the out-of-band message now, the QR code shown to the to Alice. And uh, Alice scans the QR code with a smartphone, which may or may not have an app. So it just needs to be capable of scanning QR codes and a web browser will be then open. But but uh, it's kind of, there's all kinds of tricks against uh, 
the user phishing type attacks. So it would be a little bit better if there is an app, but it's not required. And uh, then the user has to either be already logged in on the cloud server or, or will enter the login credentials and that magically attaches the device to the cloud service and, and then enables network access because the cloud server is now the remote uh, AAA server. Uh, and, and now the display starts in, in our implementation, then start, it also gets this application layer configuration and starts displaying some content. Uh, so so to, to recap this uh, use case, there's a new display device with no owner, no domain, no credentials for either cloud or Wi-Fi. And in one step of scanning the QR code, we managed to register the display device to the cloud, get Wi-Fi access, link the device to a user account on that cloud server. And uh, we also managed to export the URL and key for application layer uh, bootstrapping of, of that, the, whatever the dis device is supposed to do, like this display some web content. And um, the display device here was uh, output uh, the out OOB message as a URL encoded into a QR code but uh, the display device has no input. So that has been kind of our idea that, well, you have to be able to reset it in some cases if it doesn't start, but, uh, but apart from reset button, it doesn't need to have any input, just the just, just uh, display obviously has output. And the user has the smart smartphone. And uh, then what we need to have in the background is that uh, the remote AAA server is uh, configured uh, with a, well, the local AAA server trusts it for authentication, this EAP noob not net uh, and AIs. And, and uh, also in this case, the remote AAA server is integrated with the application level display management service. And uh, here, this still shows the same uh, comic with the uh, protocol steps, like uh, the initial exchange with ECDH happens in the background, then the out of band message is shown the user scans it, it's delivered as a, through the URL to the cloud server. The, um, if it's a web browser, the user here needs to check that it's the correct cloud server that, that she has an account to and then log in. And uh, then there is the uh, final key confirmation that happens on, again in the in-band channel without the user noticing anything. So uh, now I have a long list of um, of some uh, kind of design details and, and issues here, uh, and uh, I've selected some that uh, that might be of uh, interest. So maybe the the obvious thing is to say what is in the out of band message. Well, there is an identifier for the peer that's a server allocated identifier um, that just helps the server to to know which which, which message is. Um, uh, belongs to which peer and uh, then there is the two um, two fields noob and hoob and the noob is the secret nonce and hoob is the has of the ECDH parameters uh, they can all this can be encoded for example uh, and any respect we so an example how to encode it as a URL um, and uh, that's an important thing to know that is a dynamic uh, URL so it will change for every after every initial exchange, it will change. So let's say if it's a display you configure, it might be change every minute or so. Um, and uh, uh, so, so it can't be a printed uh, QR code. It's a dynamic QR code or a dynamic NFC tag. Uh, and uh, in this um, uh, noob is the part that requires confidentiality and hoob is the part that needs integrity. And, and one of those is, is enough uh, to get, uh, get, say, uh, get security here. Um, well, when we create, we create this persistent user association, so we don't want to repeat uh, this authentication. And this uh, is kind of one place where the, the method differs from uh, typical EAP methods that you have some uh, method of authentication and you keep repeating that. But we can't do that. We can't trouble the user every time. The, uh, the device gets disconnected from the wireless network, so we must create a persistent association and then basically at all costs avoid uh, rerunning that out-of-band step and, and uh, authenticate with this association that was created. Um, 
we allocate we need to allocate some identifier to the peer that is not necessarily visible to the user at all but within the protocol the peer must now for the, this persistent association it must be given an identifier and when we assign identifiers we need to think about things like identifier squatting so we can't believe any identifier that the uh, peer gives us or uh, we shouldn't choose identifiers that the uh, attacker can uh, can somehow steal from us and, and use and, and prevent the peer from associating. And the way this has been solved here is that the peer starts initially, the initial exchange as anonymous, and uh, then the server allocates an identifier to that peer and allocates one in every initial exchange. And then eventually one of those initial exchanges uh, succeeds uh, and uh, usually the first one obviously but but uh, if there's something goes wrong it may have repeated several times and then that identifier of the that leads to the successful OOB step and and completion then remains the peers identifier for that server and the device can additionally send in this protocol as there's a, this peer info field it can send uh, some other information about its capabilities like its brand and type and so on but uh, that information is something that uh, um, is authenticated in the sense that it is sent by that specific device, but it's not authenticated in the sense that the user has to verify that, that the device itself is not lying. Like, if you don't trust all, all your IoT devices not to lie. So if, if the device says, I don't have a camera, it might still have a camera unless you, you really look at it, whether it has a camera. And, and um, maybe some cryptographic assertions could help in this kind of case to, to check what capabilities it has. Uh, well, yeah, the association we obviously we, in the use case we used it for bootstrapping application uh, security, so the method can export keys to the application layer, and, and uh, we also have used it to convey initial application layer configuration to the peer. Although I now realized uh, this this um, during this meeting that that uh, we actually need to clarify how to do that and then maybe make it clearer in the spec. And um, if you compare this with, I mean, to me, it's essential that we bootstrap the application security with the same step, because that was our initial worry that when we configure these devices like displays, um, you often have to first enter wireless credentials tediously to, to a IoT device and then configure some cloud credentials for connecting uh, to the cloud. Uh, so you have network access and then the cloud connection. and, and uh, if we do skip one step here, then we are kind of only halfway through. Roaming support is something that was in a uh, previous IETF meeting that I attended, suggested by the EduRoam people, and um, and we certainly can do that uh, so that the device is configured in your home network, and uh, we have added this uh, uh, option for the server to send a list of SSIDs so that in addition or instead of the SSID where you currently configure the device, uh, you know that your persistent association will be valid also on this other SSID. So for example, if I configure the device on, on my university network, then it would st or the, the per association would also be valid for EduRoam and uh, the server as can uh, allocate the realm for this purpose for the device. The wireless network selection here uh, has has um, kind of troubled us a lot because we thought about the displays that should not have any user interface at all. So we didn't want to select. Uh, so if you if you have a one button on the display that you can use for selecting the SSID to which you connect it, that that solves the problem. Uh, and most app implementations probably would do this. Uh, but it is actually possible also uh, for the peer device to, to scan the wireless networks for one that implements EAP noob and uh, so where the server supports it and then perform the initial exchange and then just uh, uh, whichever uh, server first completes the exchange with that peer then wins uh, ownership of that device and then and the peer connects to its ne to that wireless network the um one thing that uh, we have had to give a lot of thought to is, is this possibility of multiple out-of-band messages being in flight at the same time and there are several cases where this may happen so there could be just uh, that uh, if it's a display that it, and the code changes every minute the user may just scan two different codes or 
if it's a printer that prints those codes, codes that's easy to think like those papers just lie around and, and there's lots of them around and one of them eventually gets delivered to the uh, to the server and um, uh, another case where you have multiple messages in flight is that uh, the uh, all, we support both directions, peer to server and server to peer for the out of band message and, and uh, never thought that that anyone would want to support both directions, but then out with, when you think about it, someone might, might be crazy enough to implement a device that allows both directions, that the protocol allows both directions for it. Um, normally you would think like output device, outputs a, outputs a code and an input device uh, inputs a code, but, but sometimes the device might be able to do both and uh, uh, the protocol supports that case as well. And then, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, there could be multiple users delivering out of band messages to different servers and, and uh, which, uh, which are behind different wireless networks and, and they compete for the device. And uh, we've uh, worked out these uh, different uh, cases of multiple messages in flight and verified this to, to check that, uh, that there is no, uh, no deadlocks caused by, by these. Another um, kind of my, for what has been quite interesting for me as a security researcher to think about uh, is this uh, crypto suit upgrade issue. So that is that is of course an event that happens very rarely. Um, but um, since we we decided that we don't want to bother the user to to redo the out of band step again at, in any case where we can avoid it. Uh, we wouldn't want to bother the user even when the crypto suit needs to be updated and um, uh, the so the normal solution when you update let's say signature the crypto uh, algorithm for signature keys for someone's credentials you also issue a new certificate and uh, mm -hmm. that's a kind of administrative process and a human you uh, is involved in that or some some uh, another layer level of credentials for deploying it but um, we don't want to do that so we want to, that's why in the reconnect exchange may negotiate a new crypto suit and update the persistent association keys uh, but this leads us to the really interesting mm -hmm. stuff um, uh, where the crypto suit up update might fail but it might fail so that it fails for one end and succeeds for the other end uh, so the issue here is the if the if you're doing a crypto suit upgrade in the reconnect exchange and um, then the last message, which will be the final uh, EAP response that is dropped, uh, the peer will move to the new crypto suit because it thinks all is okay, but the server will never receive that final message and it will keep the old crypto suit. And uh, uh, that is kind of an unavoidable problem in, in a distributed system that you can never reach this consensus about are we in the new uh, crypto suit or not, or is you know, not guaranteed. Can't you know we can't design a protocol that is guaranteed to reach such consensus if if the message is maybe lost. Um, but but the way we solve this is kind of make the peer responsible for the upgrade, and the the server just moves to the new one uh, when whenever it you know if it gets the final message. If it doesn't get the final message, it stays in the old one, and the peer is willing to roll back to the old one. Uh, until it receives a confirmation that the up server also has done the upgrade uh, for that association. And um, uh, when does it get that confirmation? Well, it, next time it does rekeying. So if, 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 the, if, they, if the synchronization failure happens, obviously the peer cannot connect to, the, uh, to this uh, network. And uh, then it tries immediately to reconnect. And that's when either uh, they will, the peer will discover the service in the previous crypto suite or it is in the new one and then it, it only keeps that one. And uh, the, the, all, the, all the attacker can do is it can again drop the final message and then it's the, but if the attacker eventually goes away, then the upgrade will succeed. But this was kind of fun thing to, to model how this process works. Uh, one, one one note about the, um, isolating the peer devices. So the so if you think of uh, devices that connect to uh, connect to this um, wireless network and and you you let users configure new devices and connect them to the network, 
uh, well, they might connect all kinds of devices to it, and especially like any out of the box device that supports EAP Noob and, and buy it from the shop and then just attach it to your local network. Uh, also, we in the some you know, in our use cases we delegate the control over this network access to some cloud server which may be provided by a third party. So, so if it's not your own own remote authentication server, but but some external service, then you're kind of trusting access to your wireless network to them. And obviously corrupt devices, IoT devices, might leak the network credentials and let anyone on your wireless network. So we think that it's quite quite, quite important to isolate these devices to a virtual LAN and, and that so that they don't get in touch with your regular hosts on the network. Preferably isolate them from each other as well, but uh, the current uh, access points and, and uh, and radio servers don't really support such features, as far as I know. But we managed to implement it on on uh, uh, open open source radios and uh, open WRT access points. Well, this is the, this is not something we can solve in our protocol, and and it applies to all kinds of IoT uh, stuff. But uh, but um, uh, I just thought it's something to keep in mind because it's probably like the, one of the big security weaknesses of of doing such. Uh, device associations. For software requirements, I just want to point out that the implementation is now on this remote, uh, triple, uh, remote AAA server, and uh, on the IoT device, we have implemented those in uh, Linux host APD and WPA supplicant. But access points don't need any changes, and the local uh, AAA server only to only needs some. Um, minor configuration changes that is routing these specific requests to the remote server. Uh, maybe I'll skip the to-do list, it's just some what we need to do next. Um, and uh, then um, summary of kind of, well, what was the solution? What is it that, what was it that I talked about? Well, why would we auto, would use um, uh, EAP uh, for bootstrapping devices? Well, the trick here is that uh, EAP allows us to do the in-band communication with an authentication server in the back, in the network, internet or, or on your backend network uh, before you have network connectivity. And thanks to that, the out-of-band communication can be one short message. And uh, in any, if you don't use, have this kind of, if you don't use the EAP tunnel, you usually have to communicate much more information. And uh, then uh, the uh, out-of-band message in our protocol is designed so that uh, it should should get either the out-of-band channel should provide either secrecy or integrity. But but if one fails, we are still okay. And then kind of you can ask like we get this magic um, attachment uh, to the network with with just scanning one QR code. But what's the cost here? And uh, of course, one thing is that. We need EAP and, and AAA, and uh, we, that means WPA Enterprise, so not passphrase networks. And uh, then um, uh, the, main, the main thing is that the network admin has to choose one such authentication server. So the network administrator makes this choice for you. And, and in this one network, you can attach devices to one authentication server. Uh, there's some comparison to other methods. I won't go through these, but I'll use this slide to answer questions if someone points out these questions about comparison. And uh, there's a link to the draft. Um, and uh, then finally, uh, what, why am I presenting it at the IMU working group? Well, uh, the, we, we don't have a working group that would be suitable for this draft at the moment. and. Uh, uh, I would like hope that if uh, the work IMO is uh, rechartered, then maybe consider in, included EAP noob in that charter. And uh, also, it would be nice if we can use the working group kit and and for uh, editing the draft and uh, the issue tracker, so that it would be a little bit more public and and uh, we could get external contributions to it. Okay, that's all. Questions. Great presentation. Um, I could almost borrow all of your slides except for a handful um, for the next one, but I won't. 
<laughs> that uh, I think actually uh, we have a, uh, there's a side meeting I told you about Tuesday, tomorrow, uh, 6 p.m. It's on the side meetings wiki. Um, and I want to look to address, like there's a series of IoT onboarding work that's going on across the organization. And, and so I, I want us to get our hands around all of it. But I, I would definitely support, um, if it's possible, to use the EMU uh, working group wiki to, to track issues here with this. And I look forward to working with you to try and, and find the common architectural components on this. OK. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know if we can use the EMU working group wiki mm -hmm. at this point, because they're not working group items. Um, but uh, there should be some way to do that somewhere. Uh -huh. Eric Nordmark, yeah, I, this is very interesting. I, I think I have other use cases when the output device is just an LED that can blink, but you can have your phone receive that stuff somehow. Um, one question I had was, uh, so can you do mutual authentication? Can you authenticate to play server with this as well? As long as the device has some credentials, it knows it's going to talk to whatever, EAP dash noob, whatever. Right. If it ha is that something that already exists in the software you have? Sorry, uh, what can I, can the yeah. device the, the authenticate the AAA server? Yes. Yeah, so it, it is mutual authentication. The device is authenticated uh, as a physical device. It's uh, the the identity of the of the device is defined by which device where the user uh, reads or writes the out of band message. So it's a physical device that the user accesses. Sure, that part, but the AAA yeah. server as well. You know, uh, the the AAA one. server, so here the user is assumed to have some way of secure channel to the AAA server. It could be, of course, physically if it's a home network and uh, and some device, you know, hub at home. But in mo our implementations, it is uh, the remote AAA server in the cloud where the user has a user account or user uses the organizational account. Uh, sure, for log from logging into that online server, and then the device is not only as associated with that specific AAA server, but with the user's username. And that's the exchange that. between my cell phone or whatever I use to scan the QR code. Understand that part. I'm talking about the yes. EAP, ex EAP exchange, whether that offers mutual authentication in this case. But yeah, so this this fact that the user has this secure channel to the AAA server, it does authenticate the AAA server to the device. So basically the device in our no. use, use case is, uh, they, they, you know, takes that. Well, to, to follow yeah. this day, yeah. to follow up on that, because yeah. I'm with him. You mentioned on one of your slides that if you don't know which AAA server to talk to, you just talk to them all. Yeah, now that is concerned. Now, what QR code do you present at that point? Because you have you have three. You've got two evil triple A's that you're talking to, and the real triple A. And yeah, so which one do you present? So we, now, I understand fully yeah. that the user is going to go to, you know, my company that I trust, and and paste in that QR code, and that's great because that then the guy then the peer knows which one of those three it was because, but still, how does he present? The display, well, the display shows them, uh, shows these three codes. And uh, if the user somehow is tricked to choosing the wrong one, uh, then uh, it doesn't really do anything. Well, there's no, uh, because, it, because it's the correct server that you're delivering it to. That's the important thing. But, but uh, mm -hmm. I mean, th this will have the, the QR code has, uh, well, in our case, we write the text there, the base URL under the QR code. Right, but in your, your um, so 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 let's your, say the dis example, display our display would rotate two or three QR codes oh. uh, with the base URL under it, and you choose the one you recognize. Okay, I think uh, we should probably move on to the next. Is it a quick question? I have one quick, a quick question. Yeah. So I, I love this idea very much and very effortless process for users. And uh, so is there any uh, requirement for like IoT vendors to develop in the device the device itself, like just um, display the QR code? Or yeah. So so the implementation it's it's. Uh, it would be the so like we have implemented the Linux W 
be a supplicant so it's the EAP supplicant side module but uh, actually you're pointing out to the tricky part of the implementation uh, which mm -hmm. is integrating the EAP layer, client, layer, layer with the user interface yeah. <laughs> thank you Um, but you haven't been abducted. Uh, hi, Elliot here. Um, last uh, meeting, um, Owen presented on um, something that we've been tossing around, uh, which is to take the Brewski work that's been done, the bootstrapping key infrastructure work, um, and apply it into EAP. So uh, problem statement, it, it was pointed out that maybe we didn't do as good a job on a problem statement as we should have in the previous uh, presentation. So. Um, these are basically a couple of uh, reasons why we went there. And I'll, I'll, I'll set this through in just a handful of slides. This is a very short presentation. Um, uh, the, the key issue is that we need a, a trusted introduction um, uh, between a device and a local deployment. Um, absent that trusted introduction, um, device is going to join the wrong network. Or they, may get, they, they may do so either out of incompetence or malice, depending. Um, and I think everybody in this room understands that problem. Um, Brewski provides for a trusted introduction, and it's a certificate-based method at this point, and it also relies on a third party, which is to say the manufacturer. You go out to the internet, manufacturer says, I, you know, device has got a, I'll explain the flow in a minute, actually, so I'll, I'll go through it. Once you have a trust anchor um, in Brewski, you go and you do an EST transaction, and you get yourself a local deployment cert, and uh, both of these mechanisms assume some amount of network connectivity. Really, it's internet. Con really, that's uh, not only uh, network connectivity, uh, network connectivity of the device, but it's also internet connectivity, as it turns out, in terms of Brewski. Um, and you don't, just don't have uh, the network connectivity in 802.11. Obviously, it's a you have a uh, a chicken and egg problem there. Um, and uh, so, of course, we looked at EAP for the exact same reasons that the EAP noob folks looked at EAP. And we thought it was pretty cool um, for the exact same reasons. And um, in fact, we thought TEEP was even cooler because it covers a fair amount of this ground already. Um, and it just needs a little bit of tweaking. TEEP tweaking? So um, here's, an eye, here, here's an eye chart for you. This is actually on the, the, the um, the materials page so you can just look at this this is the basic anima flow um, where you establish what we call provisional trust it's directly analogous to uh, what eat noob does in, in, in many respects um, and uh, what you do is you go through an, a, a, a transaction in which uh, you go at where essentially the local deployment which is the switch and the registrar really the registrar goes and asks the manufacturer is this one of your devices um, the manufacturer can say yeah it is or no, it's not, and es essentially sign a voucher request, which you know then gets returned as a voucher, which the pledge can then use to say, yes, uh, okay, I should join this network, and here are the credentials for that network, and then you go through an EST transaction. Again, yeah, this problem, which uh, all that was IP-based, work done in the Anima group, um, and so we have a, a little uh, problem there if you don't have IP connectivity yet. So what's the idea? Shove the whole thing into an EAP flow, I am not going to go through the whole EAP flow today. Uh, you can read the draft. Um, but the basic idea is that we're, you know, we're leveraging EAP TEEP. We've created just a handful of new um, uh, TLVs uh, that one would use to do this. Um, and uh, the differences between uh, this version and last version is that we've created it even a handful less than we, than we thought we needed in this version. And so we're trimming down. Um, and so we, the, the, other, the other difference uh, is that uh, we actually documented out all the TLVs uh, that we think we need. Um, and I added a, an IANA considerations to match. Um, the uh, the uh, flows themselves have been updated because in the process of defining the TLVs, that's how we found, oh, you can piggyback messages and EAP isn't that so lovely, so let's condense here and here and here. We have. Um, and so, obviously, if you look at the security uh, considerations section, it says TBD, um, which means we're nowhere near ready for adoption, uh, we're working group adoption. We're just we're just not there yet. Um, and we think there are some in, in the process of doing this draft, and the process, and also the process of looking at EAP noob. Um, 
and in the process of looking at DPP as well, actually, um, we think we've come across what we see as some architectural questions. Um, and so one of those is that there, there seems to be, we, we see challenges around the sorts of deployments that need to be accommodated in terms of credentials that they're comfortable using uh, versus the uh, capabilities of the device in terms of the credentials that they can support. Um, and so in the process of going through all of this, I've attempted to, to identify a few architectural building blocks. And I'm only gonna tease you by saying that I've done that, um, but I'm gonna present it in ops area working group and then I wanna talk about it at a side meeting directly afterwards tomorrow night at six o'clock. It's on the side meetings wiki. And um, so at this point in time, we're not asking for working group adoption. For one thing, um, I would like to look across the five or six different working groups at this organization and the five or six organizations that are looking at this entire problem. We're seeing fragmentation because of this. And to just take a step back for a moment, pause, take a breath and say, what are the common architectural components? What can we do uh, to, to re maybe reuse some of those architectural components as we evolve uh, all these mechanisms into the future? So um, this is more of an advertisement than, than, uh, than anything else. Please come to the Ops Area Working Group tomorrow. Um, let's have a bit of a discussion there about this. Um, I've got about a half hour to talk about all of this. I'll try and um, speed talk a little bit even in that so that we have more time for discussion and less time for Elliot blabbing on. Um, and then please come to the side meeting uh, tomorrow evening. It's in apartment three on the ninth floor. We only have a 12 person room, but that's okay. I figure if 100 people show up, we'll just switch rooms with someone or have the meeting in the hallway like we usually do. That's it. Questions, comments? Dan, you may speak. Close the line again. Dan Hargens. Uh, thanks, Elliot. I've, I have a few questions after reading this. So uh, does the device need to respond to the EAP identity request with any sort of adornment to route it back to the right TEEP server, or is it a, just assume that there's always one TEEP server for every authenticator? Um, we haven't even answered. That's a, it's an issue that you've just raised. And the draft hasn't even gotten that far, okay. but it's a fair question. And I see no reason to adopt the exact same method, for instance, that the new people used. Okay. In fact, I like that idea. Can I steal it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you set up this provisional TLS connection and that's gonna be completely unauthenticated. So uh, it doesn't provide any security over just sending the, the Brewski, uh, voucher request and getting a voucher response in the clear. Right. So uh, it, why don't you just make, instead of uh, hacking TEEP, just make e Brewski and send a voucher request and get a voucher response or an error back? Oh, so um, essentially, Brewski does the exact same thing. And what the way that the provisional thing works is that you, you the, the, what you have to do is by the end of the transaction, you have to have been able to authenticate the beginning. Uh, you have to have been able to authenticate the credentials that were used in the in the beginning. If you if at the end of uh, the Brewski transaction, you could not have you have not received the appropriate trust anchor, then um, then you throw away the whole transaction is the is the way that it, that it works. But if you're going to be doing Brewski after you get your voucher back anyway, then what is oh, it, no, no, that's what's part the point of, of verifying the, your previous provisional? So the, 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 the all right, I will go through the flow if we have a few moments. Um, because, yeah, okay, so the basic idea, let's see here. So the basic idea here is you, you start with, is there a pointer on the sky? Yeah, there is, I think it's very uh, So there is, okay. So <laughs> essentially, so here's where you enter a provisional trust state, right? Yes. Okay. And at this point, you, you, at this point, you have no reason to trust, which is why you're in that provisional trust phase. In fact, that's a really good signal that that says, "Ooh, I need more trust. Let me go do some brewski or something like that." Um, and uh, so you end up doing a, a request voucher. I think we might even be able to nuke that guy, but I'm not sure. Um, uh, you end up doing this request voucher, then you get a request, uh, then you get a response. At this point in time, you should be able to have validated 
the, 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 the server hello if you're the client, right? At which point you're no longer in provisional trust mode. So I won't claim to be the perfect expert on this trust model. That's the work of Ma Max Pritikin and, and, and uh, Kent and Michael Richardson. Um, but I'm essentially borrowing that model wholesale. So w what would happen if you just did Brewski vouch request voucher, vou request voucher voucher, and then Brewski voucher, the, the, the bottom? The, if we just did this part here? No, just the, the bottom two. Right, three so, and four. So there's, three and there's, four. These, these guys, three yeah. and four. Um, so we, we're relying, um, we're, we're, I think, relying on the confidentiality properties here, at least um, in, again, in a, um, in a provisional way uh, until we get back the cert. Um, and if we don't, if we don't have, the, if we don't have confidentiality, we're going to need some other mechanism for that. Okay. But you're still susceptible to like a man in the middle attack. So your confidentiality is until you, I mean, you don't have the proof of the con that, that, that you haven't been man in the middle until you get the, 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 the trust anchor. Once okay. you get the trust anchor, then you know, you haven't been man. In the middle. Okay. I, I've got a couple more questions. Can you want to push yourself? Yeah. I just want okay. is it Brian wise, just a clarification, the provisional, uh, um, authentication part is actually only on the client side. So the server side is actually assuming we risk assumes the server side can actually has the trust anchor he needs to validate the device. So it's just the device side. But not here. On, on no, your, no, I wouldn't even go that far, Brian. Well, that's 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 the Ruski <laughs> that, that's the Ruski model that's defined I'll, by Animus. I'll trust the ID and the other guy says we'll yeah. just trust whatever certificate yeah. you need. So. Okay, so uh, so I, I some I didn't understand some of these uh, uh, flow diagrams because EPSA locks that protocol and you have sometimes people sending the server sending two messages back like a ah. CSR attributes and I mean so the idea is that th those will be in the same eat message uh, as just additional TLVs yes just okay. additional right. TLVs and then so my final request then is that uh, you're overloading like a PKCS 10 TLV and the CSR attributes TLV mm -hmm. by sending a zero length I guess mm -hmm. so Instead of that, could you just use the request action TLV and, and use the action field of it to say, you know, like begin Brewski instead of sending a, a, an empty PKCS10, which is kind of weird for the server to send a PKCS10 in the first place. And it's okay. zero length. It's sort of like the semantics of that are what? Sure. We can we could absolutely adjust that. Let, let, let's talk because okay. um, there's a lot of room. This draft is, is drafty as drafty can be. Um, even in its second iteration, so we have, you know, we, we want to tighten up some of those flows. Okay. okay. Uh, so Max Pala, Campbell Labs. Uh, I was actually thinking about the old trust model, et cetera. Without trust anchors, it will not work because if you seek uh, secrecy or you know <laughs> of the parameters that you passed in the past, if you have a man in the middle and you detect it afterward. The secret is no. The <laughs> confidentiality is already compromised. So, so I'm going to refer you right back into the Anima draft, which goes into great detail about um, uh, uh, all of the security considerations of the mechanism. Okay. Okay. But that's it. Mohit, uh, I think we are almost out of time, so I'm asking this question to the chair as an author. Uh, it should be fine to use Git even for individual drafts. We don't have any strict policy on that. Well, I, I mean, I don't know. We should discuss. I mean, I, I would prefer to keep the our Git account for our, you know, for official working group items, and then, okay. you know, I mean, it's easy to create a Git account, a GitHub account, right? And so I, I, I plan to take this up. In, in, in a separate context. So I think there's an, it's important that the new uh, draft have a place to, to do that, and also this one as well. If it's not with you guys, then we'll sort that um, with the, you know, I'll, I'll talk to some of the IESG members to see if we can find the right place uh, and, and to allow for that. I'm willing to discuss that too. It's yeah. just, you know, I'm not. Uh, this is a solvable problem. I wouldn't worry. I'm, I'm quite certain we can solve this one. That's it for now. So don't look for adoption anytime, you know, anytime yet. But we want to have this architectural discussion. Please, please join in. So it's just one more question uh, yeah, sure. about you know the adoption. We saw that 
several proposals right going the same direction we had some messages from the last meeting help us ship the existing items review eptls review epk <laughs> once they are shipped we will have space for each order okay. Ooh, big threat <laughs> <laughs> So we'll have to wait until those items are. Oh, we can be very fast if you review them tomorrow. You know, we can move them <laughs> faster. Thanks. All right. Yeah, I, I mean, we can we can talk whether it's uh, appropriate or not. I, sure, like sure. The, it's just. As we get more and more things, it'll be confusing as...